off by taking a look at Auburn's Diwali celebration and a mysterious night of fun hosted by the University Program Council. We'll also take a look nationally by updating you on a government shutdown aversion plan and busy Thanksgiving travel traffic. Finally, you'll get an Auburn sports update in the pet of the week. All of that and more is coming up next on Equal Eyes Monday News at 6. Good evening and welcome to Eagle Eye News at 6. I'm Kinsley Davis. And I'm John Huff. If you were in the Melton Student Center Ballroom on Thursday night, you were in for a night of thrilling, fun, and delicious food with a murder mystery dinner party. For those of you who couldn't quite survive the night, Eagle Eye's Selena Alleman was on the scene to clue us in on all the important details. We're here at UBC Tiger Nights where they're hosting Murder Mystery, a chance for students to have dinner and work on a murder mystery. They have everything from a planned meal to an exact itinerary of what's going to happen tonight. Let's take a look. A whodunit style night full of mystery and fun. The event was a smash hit for those in attendance. UPC president and director of Tiger Nights say it's hard work, all in the spirit of inclusion. Events like this, they take a lot of people to plan them. There's so much that goes into it that you wouldn't see from planning little things like the line, how the line's going to work, to coordinating with actors who are here, budget, all things like that. So there's lots of different things that go into it. So the idea for this event was really just kind of random. We were looking for something that we've never done before. Um, and we were just sitting in a leadership meeting one day and we were like, why not throw a murder mystery dinner? Um, and so we went through a lot of research to figure out um, different companies and people, that, like actors that we could have come, as well as different catering companies. Um, and it's been very stressful the past couple of weeks, but um, I think it came together really well. Everyone looks really great and the decor everything is perfect um, so yeah it was a lot of work to put together but hopefully it's smooth sailing from here on out and we can't wait to see the show and their hard work paid off with the lively energy in the room throughout the night UPC hosts several events a week and director of Tiger Nights tells us she does it all for her fellow student body there are, are people at every single table and almost every single seat filled so that's really rewarding for us and my leadership team um, and it makes us feel good that we actually put on an event that people would like to come and see for Eagle Eye TV, I'm Selena Alleman. Auburn University hosted their annual Diwali celebration for Auburn students and the community. A traditional festival of lights, John actually had the opportunity to attend the event and offer us a special peek at the cultural experience it provided. Let's take a look. I extend a warm welcome. Last Sunday, I went to the Indian Student Association's Diwali celebration at the Student Activity Center, where hundreds of Auburn students and community members came out to celebrate. They had keynote speakers like the Assistant Chief of Police, Clarence Stewart. Awesome musical performances. And amazing food. Here's what Mr. Stewart had to say on the event. The Wally means to me, it's, it's, I guess historically it's meant to be the significance that light overcoming darkness, you know, good overcoming evil. But to me, it's exactly what I think what resonated today um, and a lot of people that spoke about, about that light, that light, that we are that light, that we are that change, and that we can make a positive change in the world. And that despite of all our differences, when you really think about it, when you really think about the things that bring us together versus the things that separate us, that's what this is about. You know, it's about unity. Favorite part of it this time is just like it has been in, in, in the past, is just the atmosphere. The atmosphere of inclusiveness, the atmosphere that, you know, no matter who you are, what your religion is, what your faith is, what your culture is, that is welcoming. Make sure to stay tuned for whatever the Indian Student Association puts on next. This has been John Huff, Eagle Eye TV. The Auburn Circle, Auburn University's very own magazine, has finally released its fall issue to the public after nearly three months of hard work. Featuring numerous subjects such as art, poetry, music, film, fashion, graphic design, architecture, and so much more, issue one of volume 50 is being distributed on the Haley Concourse through Friday. Make sure to pick up your free copy on campus between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. sometime this week. He's making is naughty or nice. Although Santa Claus won't be coming to town for another month, that doesn't make mean you can't shoot him a message. The Auburn Parks and Recreation Department is once again offering the Letters to Santa program to the community's children. Starting on November 20th, families have the opportunity to send a personal message to Old St. Nick through special mailboxes located in the Harris Center and the Boykin Community Center. 
Make sure to write your name and return address so Santa can write you back. To receive a response before Christmas Day, make sure you submit your letters by December 14th. On food distribution and the war in the Middle East and a contested plan to prevent a government shutdown. You're watching Eagle Eye TV, Auburn's Newsleader. More than a dozen Bedouins were killed by Hamas on October 7th, according to community leaders. The Bedouin are a nomadic, Arabic-speaking society, many living in southern Israel. Some told CNN they feel abandoned, like they're not a part of Israel. Here's CNN's Ed Lavendera. In a community center 25 miles from the Gaza Strip, a remarkable sight has played out almost every day since the October 7th attack. Arab and Jewish hands together, packing relief and food supplies. Many of these boxes will be delivered to residents of Israel's Bedouin society. The Bedouin are a traditionally nomadic Arabic-speaking community. They're Israeli citizens here, and many live in the Negev Desert in southern Israel. Shir Nozatsky is the director of an organization called Have You Seen the Horizon Lately, which organizes this relief effort. When Hamas attacked us on October 7th, he didn't only murder Jews, he also murdered uh, Muslims, he, uh, Bedouins, Arab citizens of Israel. Bushra El Vogas is the principal of a Bedouin school. She's here volunteering with her students. We come here to teach them that uh, living together is a good thing. Really? This is the most important to help, teach them values of life. On the morning of October 7th, Bushra woke up to the sound of rockets striking her village, a moment she calls a black nightmare. Community leaders here say Hamas fighters killed 17 Bedouin civilians as well as two Bedouin serving in the Israeli military. There are also six Bedouin civilians and one soldier still missing. So Talal says here in this village about 40 kilometers east of Gaza, this was where the first rocket landed on October 7th. Talal al Quran showed us the shrapnel from the Hamas rocket as he told us of the moment when four of his family members were killed. About 50 of Talal's family members live in this village surrounding an olive tree grove. As rockets fell from the sky, the family scattered to find protection. Talal says he was standing here on the phone when the rocket strike hit his family members where that white structure is down there at the bottom of, of the hill. There, there. Can, can right, right. I saw it, I heard a boom, he tells me, and suddenly there was no building, like it was never there. This is what the wreckage of the aftermath looked like inside his four young cousins were killed. I really miss them, he says. They were really like my brothers. It's difficult to accept, but there is nothing I can do. I must accept it. Bedouin Israelis mostly live scattered across what are known as unrecognized villages. They're not allowed to build permanent structures, so they don't have bomb shelters like many Israelis. Talal says in many ways he does feel like a part of Israeli society, he works in the health ministry, but when it comes to security, there's a long-standing issue that makes his family feel isolated. He says that because this area and this unrecognized Bedouin village is not protected by the Iron Dome and the sirens, the warning sirens, that it makes them feel abandoned and like they're not part of Israel. <laughs> Which is the goal of delivering these relief supplies to Bedouin families who've been deeply traumatized by the October 7th attack. We're packaging not just rice and pasta, but we're packaging uh, trust and hope. You have Arabs and Jews working yeah. together. It must make you smile in this difficult time. It's, it is. It's the only thing that, that makes me smile these days. And it's a really rare light in, in a terrible, terrible darkness. Ed Lavendera, CNN, in the Negev Desert of Israel. lawmakers are working against the clock to avoid a government shutdown before Friday's night's funding deadline. New House Speaker Mike Johnson unveiled his unconventional two-tiered finding over the weekend. Mike Valerio breaks down its chances of getting passed before the deadline. Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson's plan to temporarily fund the government is already facing opposition from members of his own party. One thing we know almost to a certainty is that the the GOP side of the aisle contains a number of people who are extremists and who have shown absolutely no indication 
that they want to get things done. The first part of the bill and a two-tier plan extends funding until January 19th for items including military construction, veterans affairs, transportation, housing, and the energy department. The second part extends funding until February 2nd for the rest of the government. We need, we need more time so we could pass those and then have until February to negotiate with uh, the Senate to get this done. Missing from the plan, additional aid for Israel or Ukraine, and the deep spending cuts hardline conservatives are looking for. With a slim majority in the House, Johnson will likely need Democratic support to get the bill passed. Johnson is going to do what's right, buy time, and then come together with the Dems and work in a bipartisan fashion, which is what the American people want. Some lawmakers are frustrated with the piecemeal approach. It just means we're postponing the agony. But with the clock ticking and several global crises ongoing, the pressure is on Congress to act. I mean, there's no choice here. I mean, the, the world is on fire from where I sit. Uh, it is too, uh, you know, urgent. Uh, we can't mm -hmm. sit back and do nothing. I'm Mike Valerio reporting. Veterans Day was observed across the country to honor military service members. On this day every year, Arlington Cemetery holds a special ceremony celebrating veterans with performances and a wreath laying at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Jen Sullivan recaps today's events and has more on how servicemen and women were honored near our nation's capital. Honoring military service members. Today, we celebrate and honor the men and women who have served this nation in uniform. Veterans Day marked by celebrations in somber moments of remembrance. Events at Arlington Cemetery being held on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, marking the end of World War I on this date in 1918. We gather in this sanctuary of sacrifice to pause pay tribute. Earlier in the day, in a more intimate setting, President Biden spoke to those who served and to those who have lost loved ones who served. I know how hard it is for you. It's an issue that's close to the president's heart. His son, Bo, was exposed to toxic burn pits while serving in Iraq and later died of brain cancer. Biden has said he believes there may have been a connection. I know the black hole that leaves in the middle of your chest, it feels like you may get sucked into it and not come out. According to the Defense Department, there were more than 2 million U.S. service members last year and nearly 19 million living veterans, according to the recognized veteran service organization. Americans will pause today and remember the countless contributions of our nation's veterans. A day to never forget those who fought for freedom. I'm Jen Sullivan reporting. If you plan to leave home this Thanksgiving weekend, brace yourself. Triple A's Thanksgiving travel forecast is out today. It predicts one of the busiest holiday periods on record. That's on top of complications like a possible government shutdown. Amy Kylie reports on what to expect. A triple A forecast out today predicts this Thanksgiving will be the third busiest on record for travelers. It estimates over 55 million people will venture 50 or more miles from home, and travelers could face more headaches than just congestion. Los Angeles is scrambling to reopen this critical section of I-10 after a devastating fire over the weekend. This is an emergency. This is not going to be resolved in one or two days. A possible government shutdown this coming weekend would have a broader impact. The White House is warning airline passengers could face long wait times and delays. November 2, 4, The U.S. already has a shortage of air traffic controllers. A shutdown could make that worse. That would force the F.A. to suspend hiring, close its training academy, delay the pipeline of new controllers, delay modernization. TSA employees would have to work without paychecks. From what I hear, we're looking to surpass some records here in Atlanta. Uh, over this travel holiday season. So um, to be in a government shutdown during that time is not going to be good. Workers at Atlanta Hartsfield Jackson Airport say they're especially concerned. Atlanta is the, the busiest airport in the world. So, you know, a slowdown here slows down everything else, and we just do not want that happening. 
I'm Amy Kiley reporting. When we come back, we'll give you the sports update from the week with Lydia Wellborn. You're watching Eagle Eye TV, Auburn's news leader. Welcome back to Eagle Eye News. I'm Lydia Welburn here with your quick fix of all things Auburn sports. Today, I'll be going over the past week in basketball, volleyball, and football. Basketball is back, and we couldn't be more excited. Our women's team had three consecutive wins this past week against Jacksonville State, Louisiana, and Rutgers. Savannah Scott and Honesty Scott Grayson were game leaders in all three matchups, scoring a combined total of 97 points between the two. What a way to kick off the season. The ladies host California this Friday on the plane, so make sure to show out. Our men's team also had quite the opening week themselves. The Tigers lost a hard-fought game against Baylor last Tuesday. The boys kept up well and held control with the number 20th ranked team with a final score of 88 to 82 Baylor. However, the Tigers bounced back on Friday, taking down southeastern Louisiana 86 to 71. Johnny Broom statistically led the team to victory with 18 points and 11 rebounds on the board, but Jalen Williams had quite the night himself, earning his 88th career win and becoming the winningest player in program history. The boys head to Brooklyn, New York at the closing of this week to play in the Legends Classic with Notre Dame up first. Best of Good luck to both of our basketball teams this week and throughout the rest of the season. Now for volleyball. The Tigers hosted the Kentucky Wildcats last Wednesday with record attendance in Neville Arena. Graduate student Ky Kyla Swanson led the team with six blocks and two kills, but it sadly wasn't enough to beat the number 13th ranked Wildcats with a final score of 3-0 Kentucky. Swanson, along with Madison Shear, led the Tigers in another matchup last night against the Missouri Tigers. The the Tigers' dynamic defense and dominating offense outdid our Auburn Tigers, ending in a 3-1 loss. Nevertheless, the ladies are back on the road this week as they travel to Starkville to take on the Mississippi State Bulldogs in search of redemption. Finally, for football, the Tigers rounded out Week 11 with a third consecutive SEC win and bowl eligibility. Coach Freeze and his team traveled to Fayetteville to take on the Arkansas Razorbacks last Saturday. QB1 Peyton Thorne accounted for four touchdowns. Jarquez Hunter had his third straight 100-yard rushing game, and Auburn's defense forced two turnovers while also keeping our Arkansas out of the end zone for three quarters. Quite the game for the orange and blue. The boys are back at home this Saturday as they host the New Mexico State Aggies. Let's keep this win streak going. That's about all I have for y'all tonight. Make sure to stay up to date on all things Auburn sports by following our Twitter at EETV underscore sports, visiting our website, eagleeyeauburn.com, and tuning in to Sports Night in Auburn on Wednesday nights on our YouTube page, Eagle Eye TV. We hope everyone has a safe and happy Thanksgiving break. Good night and War Eagle. Movie news to begin your week. Here's David Daniel with today's Hollywood Minute. We're searching for soldiers for a fight against the mother world. I could help you. A small fee, obviously. <laughs> the official trailer is out for Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. Sophia Boutella stars as a woman with a mysterious past, leading a group of unlikely revolutionaries against a tyrant and his troops. The epic adventure from Zack Snyder, director of 300, Man of Steel, and Army of the Dead, debuts on Netflix December 22nd. Part 2, The Scar Giver, is due out next April. Lady, we should be out there snacking on bad guys. <laughs> The sag after strike may be over, but future films are still being delayed. Venom 3, the follow-up to 2021's Venom Let There Be Carnage, was scheduled to reach theaters next July. But just as the strike was ending, Sony pushed the movie back four months to November 8, 2024. The first two Venom movies were also autumn releases. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. A town in Italy goes on high alert as a lion roams the streets. Patrick Cornell has today's story at Take a Look at This. Madonna Santa, mamma mia. The king of the Pride Lands became the king of the concrete jungle briefly after escaping from the circus and roaming around a seaside town near, well, 
Rome. Authorities believe the loose lion was the result of sabotage and is being investigated. A broken lock allowed Kimba, no relation to Simba, to escape from his cage. Very not Hakuna Matata. Veterinarians using their problem-free philosophy, aka a dart equipped with a geolocator to track Kimba and caught up to the lion near a school. Kimba caught in good condition but frightened and with a mild case of hypothermia. The entire ordeal lasting at least five hours, tense times for the town, but ultimately no one was harmed. With Kimba safely back at the circus, authorities will continue to investigate the case. Take a look at these treasures from the Titanic that just sold at auction. Among the memorabilia, a first class menu which went for $102,000. Heavily water-stained, it shows oysters, sirloin, and parsnips were up for dining just days before the doomed ocean liner went down. It's the only menu left in existence from the night of April 11, 1912. The Titanic sank on April 15th. Also on the auction docket, a tartan blanket recovered from a Titanic lifeboat, it fetched $117,000 and a pocket watch belonging to a second-class passenger sold for $119,000. It marks the exact moment the Russian immigrant went into the water. The watch was the most expensive item sold at the auction. For Take a Look at This, I'm Patrick Cornell. You ready for all of the joy that will come from Thanksgiving next week? Or maybe you just prefer a nice salad? Well, Care Humane Society has the perfect deal for you. Meet our amazing pet of the week, Salad. This boy is probably one of the most loving pups you'll ever get the chance to meet. With a love of going on walks, chasing after all of his toys, and of course meeting new friends, this perky one-year-old hardly ever barks at all. While he's often brimming with excitement, Salad also enjoys the more chill aspects of life, such as long relaxing car rides and cuddling on the couch. Potty trained, crate trained, spayed and neutered, dress Salad in love and apply for him today. We're out of time, but for more Auburn news, head over to our website, eagleeyeauburn.com, and check out all our social media pages. I'm Kinsley Davis. And I'm John Huff. Thank you for watching, and War Eagle.